The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. In this video, I will build... Um, okay, I need to check the framing. Ah, it's still not okay. Not perfect, just a little bit more. Constantly going back and forth to zoom and check the framing is so tedious. There must be a better way. Let's build something. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem, and in this episode, we are going to tackle another filmmaking problem. Since you liked my studio ceiling lights, I decided, hey, why not build another filmmaking hack? As you saw in the intro, I often have the problem that I have to go back and forth between where I'm at as a subject in the frame and as the cameraman because I'm filming everything on my own. So that gets very tedious very fast. There are a lot of solutions available to this problem. They are mainly used in big productions for focus pulling, for example, and they all are very expensive. So. In this video, I want to explore, can I make such a unit myself? What goes into that? How do I build a remote controlled system for my camera? And is it worthwhile? Let's find out. Let's start by analyzing what is on the market. There are these attachments that go right next to your lens on your camera rig. And you can turn this little knob here to precisely check the focus or adjust the zoom, depending on how you mount it. And the electronic variants are basically the same thing, just with a motor. And yeah, I should be able to recreate that, shouldn't I? To identify the crucial components of this build, I usually start by the business end. So we need something that turns the ring on the lens. So that's probably a gear set between a 3D printed ring for the lens and another gear that is connected to a motor. We need a way to control that motor. So that could be a DC motor, could be a stepper motor. Let's see what's better for this project. Then I need a way to control that motor, namely a microcontroller. I want that to be able to be controlled by a remote. So I may think about some Wi-Fi chip. And then we also need a way to power it. And I want this unit to be self-contained. So I need a battery and a charging slash battery control circuit. I'm currently doing a road test review on the Trinamic TMC 2300 stepper driver. And that is a specialized module for battery powered applications. So I thought, hey, that could work for this project. But it turned out that is very good for precise movement to a specific point but that is not what I need for this application. So the evaluation board did what it should. It evaluated that that is not the right way to approach this problem. So I need constant speed, not precise point to point movement. And I thought, hey, a geared motor would be good for that application. Something with feedback for speed. And the cheapest way that you can accomplish that is using a continuous rotation servo. Of course, I also want to keep the microcontroller on a budget that controls the apparatus. So I'm choosing the ESP8266 because that is already a Wi-Fi chip. I can build a remote with that and I can also use that to control my base circuitry that is mounted to the camera. While not the cheapest solution, it's the most reliable one. I use the Adafruit PowerBoost 1000 to take care of charging and stepping up the voltage from my 3.7 volt LiPo cell. I'm also using a voltage regulator that regulates the output power down to 3.3 volts for my microcontroller, while the 5 volts are directly going to the servo. And to connect all these things, I use a custom-made PCB by Eisler.net. So I designed that in KiCad, sent it off to Eisler, and they send it to me even during Chinese New Year because they are producing in Germany and the USA, so I can get that fast. 
while I'm waiting for the PCB to arrive, I can use my computer and design the case and the mechanical parts for this project. The design for the remote control is pretty basic. It's basically just a box with two lids so I can keep the battery compartment separate. While that design is not pretty, it serves the purpose. Form follows function. First we make it working, then we make it look fancy. In my design I anticipated that different lenses may have different force requirements to be able to turn them. So I designed a few different gears and printed them out in Multicom Pro PLA, which is a professional grade PLA material that is very tough and it also has this kind of high-tech sheen to it. So that looks pretty professional. It basically looks like all my other camera gear. Design rule number one, if you're designing camera gear, it has to be black. If it's not black, it's not professional. Mostly it's because black doesn't reflect as much. So that's why all the professional camera stuff is usually black, but a silver or a pink one would work the same way. We use all the available GPIOs on these little ESP8266 modules. If you want to have more I.O., of course you can use a multiplexer or a shift register to expand that. It's enough for this project to have it like it is. This schematic shows you how everything is connected. That's exactly what I used for the PCB design. Let's look what makes it tick, the code. Hi, my name is James and this is my electronics workbench. Together we host Workbench Wednesdays. It is a show where I review electronics tools and equipment. Whether you are on a hobbyist budget or trying to equip a professional workstation, we've got you covered. Look for new episodes on Wednesdays and come connect with me at element14.com slash workbench Wednesdays. First, I want to show you the code of the base unit because the remote code is only derivative from that code. We need to define it a lot of values like the IP addresses and the ports for the communication protocol. We are using UDP because it's fast and snappy. The pins for the communication, so the pin that is attached to the servo that has to be PWM capable. Then we have inputs for clicking, that's the middle uh, pin of the button. Then we have forward and backward because that navigation switch that I use can be tilted forwards and backwards like a click wheel. Then we make the setup. This takes care of the Wi-Fi portion. So we have to declare all the values that we need. These are defined in the variables. We have to wait for it to establish the connection. This is crucial. If you don't wait long enough, you will get some problems. Then we start the UDP server at our local port. We declare all these pins, this combination is important to make that pin work correctly on the ESP8266. Uh, we attach the servo and in the loop we are looking for an incoming packet. So if there is a incoming packet that is valid, so it has the right amount of data in it, then we extract that packet and match it to the ext value, which means external, so that's an external command. If that external command is 90, meaning off, then we shut off the servo. But if it's a different command, then we match it to the other uh, commands. In the next step, we read all the inputs that are directly on the unit. And then if something happens, then we do a function. We haven't coded it like this. So that's the complete function. We are only referring to a function. That is because I, uh, in the original idea, I wanted to use interrupts for that, but it turns out that I can't use all these pins for interrupts, so I'm using functions. So if that state is low, we choose a specific function. The functions are as follows. Increment increments the value that is used to determine the speed of the motor, the lock value by a certain amount. Uh, it's always raised by the increment amount. You can just change that up here in the settings. So it goes up by two with every click. If we exceed 100, then it sets it back to 91. 100 is the highest speed that worked mechanically on this project. 
If it's forward, we write the value directly to the servo, but if it's backward, we invert that value basically. So instead of it having a value between 90 and 180, we change it to a value between 0 and 90. And then we write that value to the servo and that makes it go in the other direction. And if we have the break command, then we use break. Break is like the middle position, 90 that should make a continuous rotation servo stop. Keep in mind that you might need to tweak these values depending on your servo. And a lot of continuous rotation servos that have a certain degree of quality, like the ones you can buy from Element 14, have a little potty that lets you adjust that midpoint. That is extremely handy in debugging. And now here is the remote code. This is the remote code. Of course, we need all the libraries and we have basically the same variables and pins that we define. So that's all the same like in the other code. Difference in the Wi-Fi setup, we use this in station mode, not in the soft access point mode. And we connect to it. We also have to wait for 10 seconds until that connection is established. Declare the pins and in this loop, we first read if there is a command on our pins. So if the button is clicked, then we go into the certain function like before, and we don't wait for any incoming traffic. We just read that button. And when that is true, we have different functions. So the increment function is the same, but forward, backward and break use UDP send commands to write that packet to the UDP port, always begin with that sentence, like the receiver IP and the port that you want to access. You can change uh, ports and IP addresses. Like if you want to send it to a different camera, you could just change the IP address and use that remote for multiple cameras, or you can exchange the port and send that to a different portion of the device. So maybe there's a second servo that listens to another port then you write the command and always end the packet. Without that, the packet is not sent. We have the parts, we have the PCB, we have the files, some 3D printing, and we're ready to assemble. Okay, everything looks fine. Let's try this out non-attached so we know that the code is working correctly and if we have to debug, we can make some adjustments before I maybe wreck a camera lens with the force that this unit exerts. Seems like everything is working according to plan. If I move my joystick the one way, it moves one way. If I use it in the other way, it moves the other way. And if I click it, I can increment the speed and it also goes down back to the initial speed. Let's mount it on the camera and try out my automated zoom. Okay, 30 teeth is not enough. Uh, let's try 50 teeth and hope that has more leverage. Okay, a simple gear is not enough. I need an external gearbox on top of the internal gearbox of the servo. So I think a ratio of one to two might not be enough. So I use one to four. And I don't do that by just using one little gear and one very big gear because that would make the unit like this big. I'm using a set of gears that should give me the right reduction. Let's try that out. As you can see, I have changed to a different lens. This one is not as good, but it also requires less force than the big one. I have the remote control in my hand and the other unit is mounted on the camera. Let's give this a go. Come on. 
Okay, that's that's very slow. Ha! <laughs> It's not as smooth as a commercial unit, but it's pretty okay. Let's try a, uh, more speed. Something that 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 sound wasn't wasn't cool, but that one was okay. Yeah, that's the the lowest setting. It's not smooth. It's like the gearing has some wiggle room and it, it engages and disengages. But I can see it's not the, the flexible ring slipping. That holds up perfectly. It seems to be the play in the gearing. So that's a mechanical issue. Of course, I can use the onboard controls. So that's the onboard controls. I'm doing that with my finger. But I can also at the same time use this one and they have individual settings. So if I give that more oomph, that's independent from that setting. This makes it really handy. I don't think commercial units can do that. But it only works on my 18 to 55 millimeter Nikon lens, which is a great kit lens, but it's not the Big one that I wanted. You see, there are issues in mechanical design. And that snapped. Ooh, that didn't sound good. While I won't be able to do intrinsic camera work on an automated scale with that one, I can still use it to quickly reframe like this. So is this unit a contender for professional grade equipment? Probably not. Could I use this to power up my workflow and get things done quicker? I'm pretty sure. So while I can't make all the machine parts in high precision quality that is required to have it completely wiggle free, I can still tweak the electronics and maybe find somebody to help me with that. But would it be financially sustainable? Absolutely not. So if I would have the need for a professional unit, I would buy the professional one. But I still will be making my own filmmaking equipment because that is a lot of fun. Do you have ideas for products that we could try to recreate in a DIY fashion and see if that's doable? Or do you have other filmmaking related ideas? Let us know in the Element 14 community. I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me.